Right, thanks a lot. I have child toys if you want. Uh, <laughs> So thanks a lot for uh, this uh, this workshop. It's really nice to be back here in person. So I will uh, try to convince you that real-time and trigger analysis are something that is quite interesting for analysis ecosystems and uh, analysis facilities. I got input from a lot of people. So this is coming from a stone soup. I didn't know what a stone soup before uh, Mike mentioned it, but you can ask him about it afterwards. <laughs> so this is a, a first a very quick intro because I think you're, most people here are pretty familiar with what this is. Uh, we do have too much data for too few resources. That's always the same problem. Uh, and we always want high statistics or unbiased selections. So we try to record as much LHC data as possible. And this means not just after the trigger and how to process it. It means also before the trigger, because we have all seen these articles where we see the problem that recording all the LHC data would take uh, 400,000 petabytes a year or substitute that with uh, your favorite uh, numbers. And uh, there's always the the articles from, I don't know, the Wired. Or, these people are throwing away 99% of their data. Are they mad? Well, actually, kind of. <laughs> but I mean, it's not that bad. But uh, you know, if you do the numbers, you get to a storage that is a lot bigger than um, what I don't know, Facebook was uh, and with a lot less money than Facebook had. So we need to select events to keep. And uh, this is the trigger system. It selects sort of 1% of the data. Uh, and it does a preliminary analysis by doing that. So there is some way to select the data and to analyze the data already somewhere there. And these will all become a more pressing issues that allow me LHC because we've seen plot from Graham that show that the, uh, the performance evolution of both disk and CPU is not keeping up with our needs. Uh, so we're blowing the budget if we're recording everything. And uh, the storage estimate I wanted to mention not to be too optimistic on, uh, on this talk that it's dominated by simulation, but everything really helps. So the solution here is that the collaborations have started doing analysis in real time. And what that means is not hard real time like engineering. It means that we're doing analysis as close as possible to the detector on the trigger system. And if uh, event throughput and time to insight, we've heard that that's, those are the, the short possible time and golden metric. Uh, and we move from an asynchronous traditional data analysis. So you first record and the store data, and then you reconstruct and analyze it to do as soon as possible, every step that you can. So the reconstructions for sure, the analysis as well, if you can, you do that as soon as the data is read out. So that the, the advantage is that instead of uh, getting bigger blocks of events, you fewer of them, you get more smaller blocks of an event size. And uh, this is done, uh, I think, more prominently in LHCB. So they have a, a comprehensive uh, set of uh, uh, this uh, real-time analysis called TurboStream. Atlas and CMS is a bit of a minority, but we're, uh, you know, we're growing. And Alice does the online reconstruction of the PPC uh, in, in real time as well. Uh, so use cases and example results. I've actually uh, not shown you the, the event size, but uh, it's a lot less than 1% of the the general event, the, the, the main event size. So we can record a lot more data. So the, the bandwidth of the trigger that is occupied by this is a lot higher than the actual mainstream. So what happens uh, when you use this data is that you can discover rare signals if the signals were there. Uh, but you could discover rare signals that are buried in large backgrounds. So you see here and note the log scale on the y-axis. Uh, this is the plot from uh, from Atlas that has on the y-axis the number of events per bin, and the x-axis is like the mass of the new particle that you're going to look for. And uh, with traditional analysis techniques, we need to prescale the trigger, so we need to throw out a random fraction of events, and it is uh, usually high. So you're not able to probe uh, particles with masses below one TV. Uh, it, this is a digest signal uh, because you're just throwing away signal and background equally. Same applies to muons. This is something that both CMS and LHCB do. Uh, and you see, again, the, the difference between the standard analysis at the red line and the scouting triggers at the, at the green line. We can actually discover signals that are really, really tiny. You wouldn't be able to see them by eye. So there are a lot of statistics issues here as well. Uh, but also, there's a, a need for that when you, need, when you have analysis where you maybe you have enough statistics, but you need selections that are as unbiased as possible. And this is, uh, I think Mike will answer any questions that you need about this. Um, so what happens in practice, and this is the analysis work from Atlas, uh, this is LHCB is uh, different from that, but this is ties into the, the two previous talks about the reduced event data formats. So in the, you get from uh, 
the doctor you do a reconstruction and the calibration within the trigger farm, because this is what you need to make a decision whether the event is kept or not. Then you just don't do anything else. You just dump the objects written in trigger farm, so you don't do the filtering. You just take everything that you have selected. Uh, that's your raw data. It's not really raw. It's already there. So instead of doing a reconstruction, you turn the byte stream into a bit an analysis form. For example, we do that and we turn this into an AOD. And this is a copy of the object collections that you've written out in the, in the trigger system. Uh, and then the reconstruction is not really like that's You basically have a copy in a different, uh, unpacked in a different way. Uh, this is your repo AOD. And then there's the processing and skimming. Um, and he, this is interesting because it's uh, something that we might or might not do differently in the in run three. So in full run two, this is this was for Jets in Atlas. We actually skip the Entuple format because we just have too much data and it wasn't very convenient to copy the information a third time. Uh, so there was not much to be skimmed. Uh, in run three, we're going to have more objects, so not just Jets. So we have to see whether, uh, since this is going to come in a, into a single stream, whether we want to divide the different streams and different objects in, uh, in smaller formats or, you know, this is to be confirmed. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, we need to have some post-processing, some recalibration, because the, we can do things a little better than the trigger because we're not necessarily constrained by the CPU time at this point. So we can make the recalibration happen at the processing or skimming level, or that is generally using, that is generally happening centrally, or we can do it in our own analysis code on the grid jobs. Um, and here I wanted to mention that the, the statistical treatment is something that is uh, giving both collaborations, I think, a bit of a headache because these uh, have a lot more statistics than uh, the statistics tool has been designed for. So uh, what are we talking about? Well, there's a very extremely loose definition of analysis facilities if you consider the trigger farm as one of that. Uh, the thing is that you don't really, I mean, it's not something that anyone can access, but it, it are, they are shared resources, shared data, and so on. But that's a different question that we can talk about, maybe a coffee. And that there's a direct parallel to the workshop topics on what do we do with the, this uh, very reduced event data format that is not quite reduced because we also need information about the calibration. So this is what we're going to discuss in the, in the parallel sessions. Uh, so just one slide about analysis in the trigger farm, why it's an interesting problem, and I hope it's interesting for, for other people that the challenge here is that the resources are very constrained, and it's uh, constrained resources with an ecosystem to thrive. It's hard, but you can still get beetles in deserts. Uh, so the, that's a quote from a workshop participant, is the trigger is a harsh and inhospital environment, so bring sunscreen. The payoff, however, is that if you do something good to improve real-time analysis in the trigger, then you benefit the entire collaboration. This is an example that uh, from Atlas and CMS, there's more, but this is something that we, we don't really think about, the, the turn on course from the trigger, uh, especially for objects where you don't have a, a perfect matching between the, what you do in the trigger and what you do at the analysis level, you end up wasting a lot of data, taking a lot of data that you record and you never look at. Because you have a turn on curve, that's the you know, turn on curve is here, trigger efficiency 99%, it's generally a sigmoid. The type, like it resembles a delta function if uh, you get consistency between the trigger objects and the offline objects. Um, and it's uh, not as steep if you don't have this, uh, this parallel. And this means that if you're recording events from a, a steeply falling distribution, you end up having sort of a peak where only half of it is used for analysis. The other half is recorded and never looked at by a number of analysis. And this is, I think, uh, an interesting problem. And this is something that uh, I think we're, uh, we're trying to do better at the trigger level in terms of recalibration to also fix that. So where are the constraints? Um, so we're talking about uh, limitations from the data taking process. There's the detector readout to hardware trigger and the hardware trigger uh, limitations. I'm not talking very much about them, but so in the parallel sessions, we're talking more about uh, event selection, object reconstruction and calibration data analysis where the limitations are the CPU for processing events. And this is something that is uh, more constrained when you're on detector because you have a limited computing farm, then you're a bit less constrained than uh, if you do it offline. And there's always the constraint of disk and tape to store events. So for Hilumi LHC, where we might want to do more of this uh, because some other physics will not be accessible otherwise, what do we want to build? And these are some questions that are coming up, have come up in the uh, collection uh, so far. 
and we'll discuss in the afternoon. So um, in terms of hardware trigger, but also in terms of the, the event filter, uh, there are heterogeneous architectures. So we're talking FPGAs, we're talking GPUs. And the, uh, the question is that how do we or the WLCG guarantee the trigger software and online software produce the same and distinguishable results? Uh, how flexible can we be? And I think here I will also uh, show another slide where I don't think this is a problem, but that's just my personal opinion uh, because there are bigger fish to fry somewhere else. Uh, anyway, this is a question that, uh, you know, you want to know if you've taken an event or not. And this is something that maybe you're like, are you, do you care about the individual event or not? That's, that's a big question, a philosophical question, probably at our level. Because if you don't know if you've taken an event or not, then your analysis is by definition not reproducible. On the other hand, how many other things are there that are not reproducible in our analysis and we never worry about? Uh, this is about the physics objects and monitoring. So um, in LHCB, I believe that all physics objects, so name a particle and you get it. They all exist in uh, this uh, RTA format. And for the monitoring, we have a specific talk in the, in the afternoon session, so I will uh, not steal that thunder. In Atlas and CMS, and I'm color coding things, uh, this is for run three. Uh, things are not public, so I just uh, carefully choose my sources. That's a public workshop. Uh, so in Atlas, uh, uh, both, both Atlas and CMS are going to expand from what they're doing. So in Atlas, we're just doing jets, and in CMS, we're doing jets and muons to more physics objects. So that opens up an, an new row of possibilities, but also the idea that we're going to move to that eventually uh, as a more, uh, like we, we're going to give the option to analyzers to use this if they want, if they can deal with the smaller amount of information for more bandwidth. Uh, in terms of monitoring, I don't have much information for, for CMS, but for Atlas, we're actually trying to test the whole workflow. Before it was a bit uh, crippled our monitoring because there's not many people working on this, so there weren't many people implementing, but we only, before we only tested the events that would end up in the main stream, uh, main physics stream, uh, instead of trying the reconstruction from the alternate stream. And that sometimes can go wrong. So we want to see that uh, happening in monitoring. There's also an interesting example of anomaly detection monitoring in the MUON system uh, for CMS. There, I think they're going to implement that for on three. There's another point that is related to that is, can we do, or do we want to make final histogram? Right? If you're concerned about the event size, why don't skip the event completely and just Take the, event, take the histogram. So there's 40 megahertz analysis cases for high Lumi LHC, but online monitoring is also probably something that is more, um, it could be also interesting for, uh, for more complex triggers. In terms of calibration of the real-time analysis physics objects, and that's something that was covered also by, by Lindsay. It's, uh, um, it's something that where complete online and offline uh, alignment is necessary, it'd be ideal, but it's not always possible. And data in Monte Carlo are both affected by this in different ways. Uh, so in, L in LHCB, uh, the question is, because the Monte Carlo is processed, is produced with data conditions that we didn't really have, we didn't know what the LHC would actually do. So the Monte Carlo is produced at one point, and then the, there's no recalibration. Uh, there's no recalibration for data period or reprocessing for data period. And this is ties into the acceptable margin discussion. What, do you, what can you tolerate uh, when you have something that where you don't know what your, your data conditions are going to be and you can't really go back to recalibrate. Uh, for Atlas and CMS, uh, uh, I'm talking here the, about the example of jets, you need to recalibrate certain objects outside the trigger um, because you get the information that you need, for example, for the off, from the offline analysis using another physics object and uh, you need the full statistics of the data set in order to do that. So you need to keep enough information in the smaller data format to do that. Uh, a question is to alternative to that is what can we do in terms of iterative calibration? The trigger sees all the physics objects. Can you use that for doing the calibration as you go? Um, and the answer is that we could, but we need to motivate people to work on it. And the other question is in general, what is sufficient? What can you neglect? Uh, and it ties into an analysis specific question of what is really needed. Do you keep everything because maybe in the future you could use it or do you just go more aggressive and say, I will take the plunge and not keep everything? And the, this is the reduced data format continuation of that. The analysis are moving towards smaller and smaller data formats, but uh, there are specific needs of uh, the real-time analysis because, uh, for example, of the calibration. So this deviates from the other analysis workflows, where one of the analysis that paradoxically have 
smaller data formats, but still use the AOD and not use the, uh, the smaller than AOD or n -tuples. And the other question is, if you find an anomalous set of events that ties into anomaly detection, what do you want to do? Uh, because it's likely that you want more information. So you need to quickly switch on an analysis mode with full raw data. So you might want to park the data set preemptively. Um, so this is just when you take the full events, you park them somewhere, you don't reconstruct them right away. And another question for the session could be, how does selective persistency or partial event building? So this is collecting a mixture of raw and trigger data, uh, tying to the reduced data format discussion. Uh, finally, this is the anomaly detection in trigger. This is my, the main use of uh, machine learning to discover something. There's a lot of um, other machine learning in trigger in the reconstruction process, but this is what we're thinking about. So there's a lot of uh, anomaly detection algorithms in the market, and that uh, that is nice. So which option to take or to implement, especially to make sure that we know that uh, we have something interesting and we don't have some uh, or we discover some kind of other noise. The one way to go would be to write extremely small records for all uh, or many random unbiased events so that you know what anomalies could, you could find in these data sets and you can distinguish them potentially. That leads to the question of how unbiased is the zero bias trigger. That's a very philosophical question. Uh, you could also record events that have been rejected by all triggers. That's another idea that came up. And as I said before, if you detect an anomaly, you turn on the dedicated trigger stream of park the data. That I think is a no brainer. It's a, we have to see if the bandwidth to do that is there. Uh, there's also an ongoing data challenge and it's, uh, uh, it's called the 40 megahertz anomaly detection. So if people are interested in trying, uh, trying out things with uh, they, their algorithm on some data and in sandbox where you can compare results with someone else, there's, the, there's a set of slides. All right, and then lastly, accelerators and triggers. Um, there is no one size fits all because the, it's interesting that different collaborations adopted different uh, different options. And this is something that is happening in RAN3, but also will happen in Hilumi LHC. Uh, one thing that uh, is uh, uh, probably one of the causes of these different choices is that the accelerator and trigger requires a software development in terms of the event data model. If one doesn't have a good event data model that matches the accelerator, then it's not useful to, to use them. I think that most collaborations have found that out. Again, the question of reproducibility, how much do we want to stress this? Um, and this is uh, something that I picked up from the Allen TDR. So the Allen is the HLT1 um, LHCD real-time analysis uh, on GPUs uh, kind of uh, box. And here it says, the, there's yeah, there is a, there are observed differences, but they are the permit level smaller, which makes them negligible compared to other data simulation differences. So if that is the metric, then you don't need to care about this. One thing that is, it would be nice to, to summarize in the white paper that uh, probably going to be produced after this plan, this uh, parallel is the lessons learned in moving from run two to run three on, because there's been a big shift, uh, for example, for, for Atlas, for, for CMS and LHCD, and Atlas hasn't made that change. So why is, why are those differences there? And lessons learned for high Lumi LHC. And also the numbers for the benchmarking for the, from the different experiments. I think having all of that in one single piece would actually help um, the future. Right, so this slide is editable. So do whatever you want with it until the parallel session then we pick up. But the idea is that we have a talk on monitoring an HLT1 in LHCD. Uh, we can decide what we want out of this parallel, probably a white paper, recommendations, maybe not uh, well taken by the collaborations if we say what they have to do, but it will be useful to have an idea. And we're probably going to be able to tackle only one or two topics in detail, so we'll cover for sure monitoring. Uh, and at the beginning, we'll discuss what to discuss uh, in uh, order of preference. So that's it for me. Thanks a lot. And uh, again, if you want to add slides, uh, go on the link and uh, just add your thoughts. So thanks a lot. Okay, so thanks very much for putting together the talk and for adhering to the time limit. <laughs> uh, Kate actually got done one minute early, so we have time for one or two extra questions. And let's see, who, how do we figure out who's online? There are Zoom questions? Okay, so in the meantime, we can start with a question here.
Uh, okay, hi, Nathan Simpson, Lund University. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. I was just wondering if you had any uh, expansion on one of the really early points where you were like, the the kind of like data volume that you're working with is like, makes the statistical step really hard mm -hmm. because the tools are not designed for that amount of data. And yeah, I was wondering what like practically that translated to. Right, so there's a three examples that I can think of, but uh, well, one is easy. Uh, when you break the max int limit, and then you even stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Right, so th that's easy to fix. Right. Um, the other is that uh, we had the fairly extended discussions between Atlas and CMS, because the statistical tools and the statistical techniques that have been used for digit searches for 15 years by now, they're not sufficient anymore for this kind of analysis. So you need to deal with your systematics due to the fit, because when you I mean look at if you look at the distribution here, it's pretty easy to see that you can fit that. It's smoothly falling. It's nice. Uh, your um, your new physics is going to be a bump. So forget Monte Carlo. And this is also why we don't care too much about the conditions in Monte Carlo. Just fit it uh, through a functional form. And the problem is the fit to a functional form for an extremely large number of events is uh, something that uh, has issues in how do you define the, the systematic uncertainties due to the fit? Do you let the parameters float or do you fix them? And the other question is, is roof fit made to minimize correctly something like that? And we're actually finding, and this is very, very new from the analysis, that it's not, it's not finding the right minimum, not all the time. Depends on how the parameters are correlated. But if you decorate the parameters, then you get into other kinds of problems that you don't find the minimum anyway. So this is the kind of thing that uh, it's a unique problem maybe for uh, for Atlas and, and CMS. Maybe other experiments are like LHCB or, or Bell, they have a lot more fitting with enormous data set kind of experience. So it would benefit uh, at some point, maybe we'll go to the statistics forum and ask, uh, you know, the inter-experiment statistics forum if there's such a thing. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there other questions now? Uh, people haven't asked so many questions. I don't. I'm Nick Smith. Uh, this actually is a follow-up to the last one. I have actually run into this problem myself with my analysis. Um, and one of the challenges, right, is if you, large, if you have a large variation in the, the parameters you're giving to Minwi, the, the natural size of the uncertainty, then the algorithm is difficult to invert. There's a inversion of the Hessian that's difficult, and that's why you have to reduce it. So I wonder if that's one of the problems here, or if there's others as well. I think there's also. I mean, we're investigating, but this is an interesting. This is an interesting problem. Yeah, maybe the thing we don't really have control on the minimization. If you use a uh, roof fit and uh, like you need to write a custom minimization algorithm, which we don't have. So maybe okay. if we did that, then we'd find out what we're talking about. Yeah, um, maybe we should talk. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. 